Hello friends, and welcome to The Hanged Man in the Moon. If this is your first time here, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm pleased to meet you. If you've been here before, thank you for returning. I'm truly honored. Friends, if you are a returning visitor, you know that this is my series in which I use tarot and oracle cards to explore topics related to living the intentional life. And before we dive into today's spread, I'd like to consider the title of today's video as a precursor, as a warm-up. The title of today's video, if you saw it, and even if you didn't, was integration. Now, what is the first thing that pops into your head when you think of integration? For me, it's racial integration. And while racial integration is particularly important in today's society, it's perhaps not the most important area of integration for those of us living intentional lives. Why do I say that? What is personal integration? Personal integration is the integration of self. It's the integration of aspects of self, of if you're working from a Jungian model, for example, the ego, the conscious mind, the shadow, the anima or animus, which is the another aspect of othered self. Yeah, we integrate all aspects of those into the wholeness of big S self. That's what individuation is all about. It's that process of integration and becoming the fullness of who we truly are as eternal beings having this human experience, co-creating these beautiful bodies that we live in. Now, why is that more important perhaps than racial integration? Do you disagree with me? I think it's more important because if we keep moving in the direction of integration, personal integration and individuation, those problems out in society will diminish, decrease, disappear. The reasons for those problems out in society is because we as individuals are not integrated. We are not expressing the fullness of who we are. We're expressing our fears, our anxieties, our worries, our disassociation. And one lar large expression, one obvious expression of that disassociation societally is segregation. We separate ourselves into the safe people and those people we think are not safe. Which is a projection of and a reflection of our personal disintegration, our personal segregation. So first, if we solve our own personal disjointedness, and the more people who do that, the more naturally the exterior problems will be solved. It's like the difference between being stabbed by a piece of metal and leaving that metal in and putting a band-aid over it and hoping it will heal, or removing the metal and then stopping the blood and letting it heal on its own. Yeah, our personal integration is where we remove that metal and let ourselves come, become one, become the fullness of who we are. And the more of us who do that, the better we are societally, the fewer problems we'll have with, between each other if we are fully ourselves. So this week's Tarot and Oracle spread is not talking about social issues, it's so much as it's talking about our own private process or desire for integration. So I've got a spread already laid out. Let's take a look at it together.
That is a beautiful spread, isn't it? And I'm sorry to say that this is the last week that I'm going to be using most of these cards. Now, the new moon just happened today. And so it's time to switch out decks. But we've got this set of cards one last time. So let's take a look at them deeply and appreciate them together. In the United States, this is Thanksgiving when I'm recording this. So let's give thanks for these cards. Now, of course, I don't think that everybody in the world needs to celebrate Thanksgiving in the United States way. I don't even think everybody in the United States has to follow Thanksgiving in the United States way, in the traditional way. But it's a good opportunity for us to remember to be thankful. And the more opportunities we have to remember to be thankful, the better. We are the better for it. So let's be thankful for these decks. And um, I have good news. The last three videos, I've said that how sorry I was that two of these decks were out of print. One of these decks is going to have a Kickstarter campaign for the third and final edition. And um, I'll put information for that below. There will be a video about these decks and the creators at the end of this video, a short clip giving you that information below. There will be links to these decks if you want to check out one or more of them and perhaps purchase for yourself one or more of them because they're beautiful decks. Again, one of them is still completely out of print. One of them is about to go on a Kickstarter campaign and I'll have a link to that below. And the other decks are available. So check them out. Remember, I do not get any money if you purchase from those links. I'm just giving them to you as a as a service. <laughs> it is a service. It's, I just want to make things more easy, convenient for you and easier for you. Okay, so spiel over. We saw the whole spread. And if this is the first time you're seeing this kind of spread, let me give you a quick overview. I've got a video on the creation of this spread and what the parts mean and how I read with this spread in detail. And if you want to see that video, I'll put a a card up here for you to hop over and check that out because this is a spread that I've used quite often and if you're a brief explanation might not be enough for you but here's the brief explanation there are four cards in the center they give us the main idea of the spread the thesis statement there are three cards above and they give us the area of mind the air yeah what we are looking at where our attention is going what we're thinking about and then there were three cards below. They give us the earth, the gr our grounding, what we are doing in the in the world, um, the ex what we are, how we are interacting with the real world, with the physical world. And then there were two cards on the side of the central four. Those were from Oracle decks, and they give us an integrated uh, piece of advice. So. That's how we're going to read this spread and in the order that we will read it. We'll begin with the central cards, the four cards in the center, which is the thesis statement. Let's take a look at those together. This is a beautiful set of cards, isn't it? And I've used this deck for quite a while, and I will continue to use this deck because I'm still learning it, I'm still practicing with it, and yes, I'm still reading with it. Um, now, when I laid these cards out, I laid them out from upper right in a clockwise fashion. So, we started off with the Two of Swords upright, and then we moved to the Seven of Wands reversed, and then down to the Sun, also reversed, and then the Six of Swords, also reversed. So we had three reversals in a row, starting off with the Two of Swords upright. And that's where I'm going to begin reading these four cards in a series. Also, that's where I got the title for the, today's video. It's from that Two of Swords upright. I think that's the main point or the main idea for this whole spread. So what is the Two of Swords upright? The associations for the Two of Swords in its upright position are Saturn in Libra. Now, Libra ruled by Saturn. It's, the, the, it's like a harsh judge 
is what comes to my mind when I think of Saturn in Libra. It's boundaries of balanced law, of balanced thought. It's also the harshness of making divisions of yes, no, good, bad, this, that. Also, we have Venus in Scorpio. Now, Scorpio's, um, Scorpio is the domicile of Mars, right? Scorpio and Aries are the do domiciles for Mars. So Venus, being in Scorpio, is in her partner's house. So it's a compliment, but it's she's not the happiest there, or she's not the most comfortable there. She doesn't have all of her stuff around her. She's she's trying to take care of her her boyfriend's place. Yeah, she's gone into her boyfriend's sloppy apartment and is now trying to deal with it. Um, so yeah, Scorpios can be a little bit a little bit sloppy, a little bit harsh, right? I can say that. I'm a Scorpio Ascendant. So there's a little bit of a, 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 a harsh, sloppy wateriness to Scorpios. Um, so anyways, <laughs> um, so what does this mean? It's the meeting of oppositional minds, for one thing. How can, can we get that from the image on the card? Let me show you the card upright right here. Can you see? That's the card. It's a beautiful card. We've got two swords, one pointing up, one pointing down, each held by an arm. One arm in light, one arm in shadow. On the top, we, let's see, I, my copy in front of me is in black and white. Let me take a peek. Okay, yes. So on top, we have a green sphere at the bottom. We have a pinkish purple sphere. And we have mirrored couples, yeah, top and bottom. They look very much the same. The winding snake with a crown above above them, that way and reverse, they look very much the same, do they not? So we're looking at this upright though. And so we have the mass, the male, the female, we have the up. The sword pointing up, the sword pointing down, which kind of reminds me of the Tree of Life. The sword of harshness pointing down, the downward path, the, um, the, the arm of uh, mercy, the upward reaching path on the Tree of Life. And in integration of those, and there are those two triangles as well, the triangle pointing down, the triangle pointing up, and they merge together in the center. And that's what this card is asking us to do. Yeah, it's the meeting of oppositional minds. The meeting of minds that are, have different agendas, different things that they want, um, one being passionate, one being cool, perhaps one being um, intellectual, one being practical. Uh, those oppositional characteristics meeting together. It's also, I mentioned, Venus being in her partner's house, right? So there's that aspect of being unfamiliar with where we are because we're not meeting somebody or an aspect of self that is easy for us to deal with. You get two people who have the same way of living together and they'll probably integrate very easily. We get two people together who have very different ways of living. They're unfamiliar with how to deal with the other, right? So that there's that idea here, but we're looking at that as internal aspects. So we want to keep the balance within as we try to work out how these aspects of self are going to work together. We want to reconcile the severity and mercy and meet in the middle. Not only meet, but unite in the middle. We want to use our discernment and our uh, self-discipline to, to meet with forces that seem alien, to meet with aspects of self that seem 
alien because we've already othered them. Does that make sense to you? We other aspects of self, and those are the aspects that become first the anima or animus. I am this, so I'm not that. And then there are other aspects which we other, and those become the shadow. So these are the aspects that we're not really familiar with because we've pushed them away. And so when we try to bring ourselves together, there is an unfamiliarity there. We're meeting the other, which is different from us. Or that's the way we perceive it. It's all us. It is all us. It's just that there are aspects that we have othered. And we want to meet with them. And they'll seem alien. They will seem very, very different and strange and maybe frightening or maybe um, dangerous. However, as we meet, as we join, we discover there is a third path. It doesn't have to be my ego's choice. It doesn't have to be my shadow's choice. There is a third choice, which is born of the meeting of the two. A path that has been lying in the background all this time. As we tug in different directions, like the chariot card. You imagine the chariot card in um, both Terre de Massé and in a lot of the Smith Waite based decks. And we got these two horses, usually one light, one dark, pulling in opposite directions. One maybe being the ego, one being the shadow. I want to go this way, I want to go this way. We, they meet together and they say, well, how are we going to do this together? There's always been that third path forward. Not this way, not that way, but the easy path of the center. It's a path of humility. Again, not the groveling humility of, um, and I keep thinking of uh, Martin Luther, I am a worm and no man. Not that kind of humility. It's the humility of equals. It's the humility of I and you you are absolutely worthy. I am absolutely worthy. But that doesn't make me better than me. That doesn't, no, it doesn't make me better than me. It doesn't make me better than you. It doesn't make you better than me. It's that humility of equality, of equality. And that's the way we also want to negotiate our integration within. The ego is not better or worse than the shadow. The shadow is not better or worse than the ego. And they are not better or worse than the self because the self contains all of that. So we meet and, 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 and bring together aspects of self in humility. Also the humility of, I'm not exactly sure how to do this. We might want to lift that process up to the eternal nature that we are. And open ourselves to the assistance of the eternal nature that we are to do that process, to instigate that process, to begin the alchemy of integration, personal integration. We want to make peace and find common ground. We don't want to get rid of the shadow. We don't want to destroy the shadow. We don't want to eliminate the shadow. We don't want to run from the shadow either. We don't want to repress the shadow. We don't want to make the shadow God either, and some of us do. Some of us make the shadow God. We want to meet the shadow in humility. We want to meet the anima in humility. We want to meet the archetypes that we carry within us in humility as we integrate all of them in a process. It's not a, I mean, there are some. There are some who it's like an instant one and done. There are stories of that throughout history. The probability is it's going to be a process for each of us. And it's a process of the third path. It's a process of humility. It's a process of the journey of, of individuation. 
And that's what this card here is reminding us of. So each week I ask the same question. How can we live this week more integrated, more integrated? <laughs> I've got integration on the brain. More intentional lives. And it's all these in words, right? Yeah, Integration, intention, uh, individuation. All of these are the path of evolution and growth and living the best lives we possibly can, living the fullness of self. So today we're focusing on integration, especially integration of mind. And mind, remember, is not just here. Mind is throughout the body. Mind is what will survive after the body is gone. The mind will integrate back with spirit. Will integrate back with the eternal natures that we are, because the eternal natures that we are, our spirit, our mind, our consciousness, and that's all this. Now, cups can also be spirit, but there's a different kind of spirit indicated in the sword suits. Suit. There's only one sword suit, and the sword's cards. So that's where we're starting, yeah? Um, and again, this is very different from the two of swords in a um, Rider Waite Smith, in a Smith Waite deck. Remember that card? It's the card of the, in Pamela Coleman Smith's art, of the lady, the woman, sitting on maybe a concrete block in a beautiful white gown. Her eyes have been bound, have been, she's been blindfolded like blind justice. She holds two swords crossed over her chest and there, were, there are waves in the background. I believe there are ships in the background indicating rough waters, rough emotions. And it's the card of indecision, catch 22, but this is different. This card is reminding us to integrate, to not so much choosing, but integrating self and finding a way of negotiating in areas that we are perhaps unfamiliar with, which is part of that integration process. And so we move from the Two of Swords. We move from the Two of Swords into the Seven of Wands in reverse. And let me show you the card upright. We've seen this card often. The Seven of Wands, the associations here are Mars in Sagittarius, uh, fire in fire, fire planet in fire sign. Also, also not also, but in reverse, in the detriment of um, in Pisces, what ah, uh, what is the what is the the planet? Just a second, what is the planet? It's uh, I'm sorry, not in Pisces. It's Jupiter and Gemini. That's it. It's Jupiter and Gemini. So in reverse, it's Jupiter and Gemini, in that which is a detriment. Gemini, the original, the the how is the house of? Why did I get my words right? Gemini is the house of um, Venus, right? Yes, yeah. Cancer, no, it's the, it's the house of Mercury. I'm sorry, it's the house of Mercury. Venus is Taurus, right? Uh, 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 the, 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 the Gemini is the house of, v, of uh, Mercury. Yeah, that quick, dashing, darting thing. The darting planet, the communicative planet, and Jupiter is this expansive thing. So all this expansive in Gemini, which is kind of like this and that, go here, go there. It's um, both of them are a little uncomfortable. So what is this card saying to us? It's a card of false starts. Have you ever made a false start? You you want to try to do something and you begin and it it, it doesn't go anywhere. Maybe you begin a YouTube channel and it doesn't seem to go anywhere. Maybe you begin um, a crafts project and it seems to crumble before your eyes. Maybe you go searching for a job and it, you, it just doesn't land. It's like you, you go on an interview and you realize as you walk in the door that this isn't it. And the interview goes crap and, 
And there are various aspects of life where these false starts can happen. Where, are your, where have you noticed false starts in your life? Maybe we begin to study something and it, we very quickly get bogged down or blocked or lose our concentration or our drive or our focus. These are all ideas of this seven of wands in reverse, the false starts, which drain our energy, right? You put all of this energy into the burst of the beginning and it goes nowhere. And so this energy just, it's like um, a dam with a hole in it, a water dam with a hole in it, just gushing water. That doesn't really go anywhere particular, in particular because the dam sh should be holding the water in place to be used effectively. But this water gushing out is just gushing out. Which is interesting, I went with the water image when this is a fire card, right? So it's false starts, draining energy before anything viable can really take root, can really begin, can really um, rubber meets the road, yeah? The, can really get traction. And why? Well, perhaps it's because we're not ready. Perhaps it's because we're not prepared for it as we thought we had been. Maybe it's because we've allowed our own limiting beliefs to block ourselves, to cut ourselves off from our own willpower, from the power of intention. Now, those are two very great po 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 potentials, possibilities. One, either our own limiting beliefs have cut us off from the power of intention and the use of the effective use of our willpower, or we're just not ready. We don't have the skills yet. We don't have the means yet. We don't have the information yet. We don't have the background yet. We don't have the we don't have the the. We don't have the resources we need, whatever those resources may be. They could be physical, they could be mental, they could be emotional. They could also be um, our passion. We just haven't built up our passion enough, our creativity enough to really begin the journey. So what? We want to check ourselves. We also may want to check our smugness at the door too. Yeah, that those false starts could be because we're not noticing that we're not ready. And we may be not noticing that we're not ready because we're smug. We have hubris. Do you remember studying hubris in school? Yeah, Hubris is what creates the Tower of Babel and why the Tower of Babel falls. We think we're better than we are. And of course, we are infinitely good, but we think we're more prepared than we are, that we're smarter than we are, that we're not smarter, that we have more information that we do, than we do. That we can do all these things, but we haven't prepared ourselves to do all those things yet. That's the smugness, that's the hubris, that's the, I can do anything. Yes, you can do anything, but maybe not right now. We need, we need to evolve into the beings that can do the thing we want to do. We're, we're not ready yet. That's what this card is here to remind us of. And also that others are just as good as we are. Maybe we went on an interview, somebody else got the job and we didn't. It's not because A, we are horrible, or B, they are tricky. Other people are just as good as we are. Believe it or not, even people you don't think you like, they're just as good and just as important and just as divine and holy as you are. Now, maybe they're not expressing it as much as you think we think we are. And heck, maybe we're not expressing it as much as we think we are. That's part of that check your smugness at the door. But other people are just as good as us. And so, we want to choose our challenges. We want to choose what we're doing. 
and hopefully we'll choose what is for the greater good. We're not choosing to do something just because we'll get some kind of shiny trophy that will feed our wounded ego or prop up our wounded ego. And most of our egos are wounded. A lot of us, almost all of us, do things in the world because of our wounded ego. We want to do things that make us feel like we are great because we don't really feel like we're great. We're, we've got this ego that wants to think it's in charge, it's in power, it's the best, the smartest, the sexiest, the most passionate, and yet the ego is not. And so we try to get all these trophies to support up that that insecure ego hiding behind the mask of brilliance, when really we are brilliant, but in the background. We're brilliant as our eternal nature is having this human experience. So, the things we want to do, we want to do not for the trophy, but because they're good for us and those around us. And if we're doing that, then probably we're going to sidestep the pitfalls of one, our smugness, two, our ill-preparedness, because we're not doing it for us, we're doing it for, we're not doing it for our trophies, we're doing it for our evolution and for the benefit of those around us as well. And if we're also doing it for others, perhaps our own limited beliefs will start to crumble a little bit. We'll, we'll, those cracks in the walls that we've built up around ourselves of our limiting beliefs. Cracks will appear and our light can shine through. Our willpower can release itself. Our spirit can release itself. But this is also a sign of not being integrated, right? So we move from that, we want to be integrated, but often we find ourselves in the reverse seven of wands. So what? So the sun. Now, I was a little bit freaked out, eh, taken aback. Okay, I was greatly taken aback when I saw this card in reverse. Because I really, 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 really wanted to see the sun upright. I really, really did. When I saw the sun... I was happy and then I saw it was reversed and I said, oh no. But it's a beautiful card, right? We've got Apollo with a shining sunny head, leaning or standing near a tree that has gentle, beautiful foliage, not blocking the sun, but just showing vibrant life. And in the background, we have a couple in a passionate embrace of joy and love and integration. So, Upright, I see this card as being us out into the out in the world, being the sun, being the, be expressing the love, joy, and well-being that we are, and integrating with other people, being able to integrate with our partners, with our friends, with the people around us. So, what does that mean in reverse? Now, in many traditions including the Rider-Waite-Smith deck, including the deck by um, Pamela Coleman-Smith and Arthur Waite, the sun in reverse is not a negative card. It's still a positive card. The sun doesn't have a, a negative meaning in some, in some traditions. And so the way that I'm reading this card is upright, it's us in the world. In reverse, it's us, our inner experience which follows from that Two of Swords. And so when I, I allowed that idea to integrate within my reading of this, this set of cards, then I relaxed into how I was going to read this Sun in Reverse. So the Sun in Reverse for me is the inner work of the Sun. It's doing the inner work of bringing together aspects of self. It's doing the inner work of uniting to form our inner androgyny. 
Does that make sense? What is androgyny? Androgyny is actually our natural state. In fact, there is that myth, if you recall, I think it's a Greek myth, where um, we were all androgynous. We all had both mas what we call masculine and feminine. I don't like those words anymore, but masculine and feminine. We had male and female aspects. Um, and the gods saw how powerful we are as beings and said, no, 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 and split us in half so that we had half of our power. And so there became the male people and the female people only, mostly. There are some of us still born with more than one set of um, sexual glands, organs. But generally, mostly, we are either male or female, right? When we're born. Uh, and some of us transition, and some of us are in the process of transitioning, and some of us have transitioned. But still, even then, we're going from one sexual expression to another. Not gender, but sexual expression to another. And so, the, because of that, the myth says that we're always trying to find our other half, our soulmate. And that's where soulmate, the idea of soulmate comes from, or is it's a reminder of. Why did I say all that? I said all that because that would be an expression of trying to find the other, whether that other be a male person or a female person, or another, a, an other, another kind of person, um, irregardless of our own bodies. I'm right because we all love who we love. However, in this card, we're doing the inner work of drawing that othered gender towards us. And in Jungian ideas, if our external gender is male, masculine, then we have an anima inside of us which we can integrate. If our social expression is feminine, and again, I don't like those words, but for convenience of understanding, there's that feminine idea. We each have inside of us an animus, which is the masculine, and we can integrate that. So the goal of integration, of, of individuation, is androgyny. To, ex to integrate all aspects of self. And that's what this card in reverse is to me. It's that bringing together of all gendered or othered aspects of self. The unity of the interior. And recognize the truth of both of our conscious, of both our conscious and our dream state awareness. So it's not only that I've got this uh, ego and shadow, I've got this male form, uh, masculine form on the outside and an anima in the interior or the other way around or some other combination, but there's also our conscious mind and our dream mind. And in some traditions, in fact, I just saw a really interesting um, <clears throat> podcast with Colette Baron reed talking about um, the dreams and uh, dream work and the man who was talking about that uh, who was trained in um, mm, indigenous traditions of dream interpretation and dream work was talking about how the dream in those traditions the dream world is not of a figment of the imagination. It's not something that we create inside. It's a concurrent state of this conscious world and the dream world. And both are equally important. And this card is reminding us that we can recognize both our waking state and our dream world state and integrate those as well. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the power that that would give us? 
our dream time experience integrated with our waking experience would make us would make it would allow us to become the light that we are it wouldn't make us do anything it would allow us to become the light that we are wouldn't it so we're on the eternal cusp of rebirth that rebirth of the unity the oneness of who we are so we want to prepare ourselves to release ourselves from the programming that we have allowed ourselves to accept. Nobody made us accept our programming. We allowed ourselves to accept the programming of things like our limiting beliefs, our self-image, our persona, the, the, the image of self that we project out into the world, the images of self that we project out into the world. Yeah? My son self, my son daughter son son self my um my my uh teacher self my uh friend self my stranger on the street self now all of those are programming that we have allowed ourselves to accept and to use often to benefit in society however we want to be prepared to let go of a lot of it And we want to be prepared to let go of the bondage of victimhood and the bondage of perpetrator. Do you recognize those times when you have actually done harm to others? You have. I have. We all have. Do you recognize the victimhood that you still carry within yourself? You do. I do. We all do. We all, except for the very, very most enlightened of us, carry our victimhood with us. And some of us wear it as a badge, right? I am the victim. I am the one who has suffered. And while that is true, we don't want to dis define ourselves by that. We want to be able to let that go rather than pump puff ourselves up with it. And a lot of us, many of us, puff ourselves up with our victimhood because it makes us look important, makes us, it draws attention to us. And while we are entirely worthy of intention, of, we are entirely worthy of attention, we don't need to draw it to us with our victimhood. We can allow ourselves to let that go allow ourselves to heal, to bring together that aspect of the victim, which, is not, which can be healed and integrated within the self, rather than worn as a protective badge trying to get attention. Like a merit badge, right? So we want to let go of the bondage of those roles so that we can gain access to the fullness of who we really are to the full access of our personal, conscious, unconscious, and maybe even collective unconscious, to gain access to the fullness of who we are in these bodies having this human experience. That's what this sun card to me in reverse is. And so, we're reminded of the six of swords in reverse. And let me show it to you upright. Here we have this beautiful small bay and a ship looking like it may be leaving the protection of the bay, going out into open waters. There's this bright light in the sun, in the sky, perhaps the sun, with a triangle, a, a red triangle, an orange triangle, with the, this bright energy, right? The Six of Swords. Um, upright it is, uh, Saturn in Aquarius, which is a very happy pairing. It's, their do it's the domicile of Saturn is Aquarius. In reverse, what do we get? It's also the domicile of Saturn, but this time in Capricorn. 
Aquarius, it's the mind, right? Capricorn, it's the work. It's doing the work. It's the harshness of work, perhaps. But still, Saturn is very comfortable in Capricorn. So the reverse is, ain't so bad. It's not so unsettling. It's not so disruptive. But it is a signal. It's a signal. What kind of signal is it? Do you, let me see if I didn't mention this, the bird here. Can you see the bird there in the center, right above the ship? It's a dark bird um, with orange and yellow wings, right above the ship, right below the triangle. Let me give you one more shot at it. So this bird could be many things. What, are, what do birds mean for us in Tarot and other dream symbology? Well, as a symbol, for me at least, the bird is the Holy Spirit. The bird can also be Sophia. It's the divine come down as both a messenger and creator of this physical realm, and the one that bridges both the non-physical and the physical. So, in reverse, we want to allow the bird to guide us and to protected harbor. So instead of the ship now going out, leaving protected harbor and able to move on, being able to move on, like the Six of Swords in a Rider Waite Smith deck. In the Pamela Coleman Smith's art, we've got the ship with the swords. The ship is going from rough waters to clear waters, and there's light out in the distance. And we think of what? We think of um, leaving things behind, leaving behind um, our, our negative thoughts, moving out into a brighter, um, happier lives carrying some of our ideas with us, but leaving the crap behind. It could also be real travel. It could be death for some people. Um, but yeah, moving on, moving across, maybe moving across the river Styx, but moving across, leaving the rough waters behind. So this card upright still has that idea of going, leaving the protective bay. In reverse, I see it as the ship coming into the protected bay. It's allowing the bird, allowing Sophia, to guide us into a safe space. Now, why do we want to get into a safe space? Why do we want this protected harbor? Well, we want to get here because we're not integrated yet. Yeah? We want to get into this protected harbor so that we can later venture forth into the open seas when we're ready. But we ain't ready yet. Do you feel ready? If you do, great. Just check yourself. Be sure that you're not in a seven of wands reversed situation of hubris. Double check and then go if you are. And it's okay if you're not. If, if whatever we start crumbles before our eyes, we've learned, we've grown, and we can go back into our safe harbor. And in this harbor, what can we do? Well, we can check our ability to integrate both science and spirituality. This is still a swords card. It's still a mind card, right? And sixes, the six of swords in, um, in the Thoth deck, it's science card, right? And here we've got spirit. So we can integrate both science and spirit. Integrate our analytical and our spiritual minds. The, the spiritual wisdom and the analytical genius that we both have, that we have of both. Not we both, well, we both have, and we have both of those aspects in all of us. Do you recognize yours? Do you recognize your intellectual genius as well as your spiritual wisdom? Can you imagine bringing them together into one? We want to integrate both the modern and the ancient, the traditional and the innovative. So this is also a card of innovation, of integration in our path of individuation. We want the practicality of Capricorn to guide and navigate 
our lives in this harbor as we assess and we determine how ready we are to move forward. So this safe space, this harbor that we can move into, in this space we can do the work of, 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 of this, of the sun, so that we can get to the integration indicated in the Two of Swords. Avoiding this. And if we do fall into the trap of the Seven of Wands reversed, that's okay. We can take a step back. Recognize we're not ready and do the work. Do the work, as Brian, Byron Katie says. Yeah, do the work. Does that make sense? So, main idea. What do we want to do? Integrate. When do we want to integrate it? Now. And allow ourselves that safe space. And we, if we do want, think we're ready and we take we, our ship, we guide our ship back out into the water and we notice that we get, start getting knocked over, we get close to, being, to capsizing, then we turn our ship around, go back into the harbor and continue the process of integration. Because that's really the most beneficial thing that we can do for ourselves. Okay, so friends, we've got three cards above and three cards below to look at in addition to advice. Let's take a look at those. These are also beautiful cards, right? This is the deck that's going to have a Kickstarter. This is the one. So if you want this deck or you've been interested in this deck, look at the link below. This, according to the creator, is going to be the last version of this deck. Now the third edition, the third and final, she says. So just saying. What did we get? We got from left to right, we got the Wheel of Fortune, the Knight of Cups, and the Star. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm going to read this from left to right, because while I do see that the, um, the Knight of uh, Cups is facing the Wheel of Fortune and the Star card looks to be facing the other direction. Um, I think leaving it, reading this left to right is probably the best way. That's the direction it was laid out in and I don't see a really strong need to read it in another way. I mean the Knight could be the center of balancing but I think going left to right is correct. So I just wanted to reinforce that for myself as I read these for you. Um, Wheel of Fortune, very different from the artwork of Pamela Coleman Smith where we have the wheel in the center with tarot written around and uh, we've got, uh, or rota is another way to read that, we've got a, a kind of sphinx-like creature at the top, we've got creatures on the side, actually the Terra de Marseille is also very similar, right? And then we've got the four, uh, the four uh, um, what is the other word for angel? The four, um, not evangelists, the four, well, okay, the four winds, the four evangelists, also possible, the four zodiac signs, the four elements, or the four, mm, seraphim, that's it, the seraphim around the card. Yeah, the eagle, the angel, the lion, and the bull. So, we don't have any of that. What do we have? We have a, a woman standing below, or I'm sorry, behind a, a beautiful disc looking a little bit like a, a wheel in front. A, a kind of a, a very impressionistic landscape behind. Wheel of Fortune. What is this? This is usually good luck, but it's also karma because if we're not going up the wheel, we're coming back down. Yeah? We don't stay at the top, right? We're either going up, we're at the top, we're going down, or we're at the bottom. That's the idea of the karma of this Wheel of Fortune. That every action also has, an has a reaction to its life cycles. 
in all of them, birth, aging, death, or menstrual cycles, or um, uh, cycle of the year, yeah, summer, winter, spring, fall. Now those weren't in order, but you know what I mean. It could also be a turning point where things turn to a different, turn into a different direction which we, we may like because we don't like the direction we've been going in, or it might be a direction that we are surprised by and maybe not like as much. Destiny, serendipity are all things that are associated with this. So what does that mean, <laughs> really? What, what is the advice here? Well, the advice is that, okay, so we want to integrate. And sometimes, since we're not integrated, Stuff will happen. Now that we're good, the wheel is going to continue turning. Whether we're integrated or not, we're going to get, keep going up and down, up and down, up and down. Now, once we are integrated, what happens? Generally, we think that we're going to move to the center of the wheel and we'll be able to observe from that center the movings and turnings of the world around us and we will be able to continue oh, moving forward with the powerful current of intention. We don't stop moving, it's just we stop moving up and down, up and down as we spiral through our experience of this world. Instead, we have this clear, smooth sailing path at the center, as we can see the things going up and down around us. Does that make sense? So, where are you on the wheel? Are you at the edge where it's going around and it's pretty disorienting? Are you in the middle where it might be feeling like it's moving a little slow, more slowly? Or, if this, or are you closer to the center where you feel the, the ups and downs a little bit, but it's, it's not as dramatic, it's not as um, disorienting or disturbing as it was when you were at the edge of the wheel, going around, around, around. Where are you on the wheel? How much... Um, is karma knocking you off balance? So we first we want it to, one, realize that wherever we are, things will get better, and then they'll get worse, and they'll, then they'll get better. It's, it's a common thing. But we also have the potential to spiral our way into the center, to our integrated self. So what do we want to do? We want to do the Knight of Cups. The Knight of Cups is the cup... Oh, we had the Knight of Cups recently reversed in the other deck, in the Tarot of the Holy Light. And the Knight of Cups in both of these card decks is a little similar. In that deck, we got the idea that sometimes we put on the show of the Knight of Cups, but we're really... Um, disassociated from other people. We, we built this space that nobody can actually get close to us. And we've dug a moat around ourselves that people cannot cross. We've got, which, on the other side of the moat, there's this beautiful facade of spirituality and art and creativity and music and poetry, but nobody can get into the real us. Here, this card upright, is reminding us of our creativity and our imagination. This is the tool we want to use for our creativity, for our integration. Creativity, integration, romance. Now, romance, what do you think of when you think of romance? You think of um, dating apps, <laughs> Grindr, Tinder, whatever people are using these days. Do you think of um, long strolls on a sunset beach with holding somebody else's hand? That's romantic. That's certainly romantic, at least to me. Do you think of leaning over a bridge on the River Saint in Paris uh, with uh, um, a glass of wine and maybe a rose in your hand and somebody there beside you, or maybe even alone. 
Maybe you don't even think you need somebody else there to have a romantic experience. That's also possible. But still you think of the setting of the, the river, the smell of the rose, the wine, or the architecture, the beautiful architecture, or, the, or art. You go into a museum and you experience the art. Is that romance for you? Those are all wonderful, but they're an external experience, right? Even with your soulmate, that's an ex external, an apparently external experience. It's you and the other, this outside other. Now, really, secret, there's no outside other. All those people you think are out there, they're not out there. They're part of us. They are us. They're, it's, we are all one, right? But we came into this physical world to express, experience this otherness, to experience the, to experience the duality. The duality is not the glitch, it's the feature. But it's how we work with duality that's the trick, right? So we want to integrate within this, within this dualistic reality. And that's the romance here. It's the romance, the interior romance of integrating aspects of self. We want to fall in love with our shadow. We want to fall in love with our anima or animus. We want to fall in love with the archetypes that we carry with us. That's how we are able to integrate and hold the what our interior other up as equal and are able to meet and join and find that third path that we talked about. Think of approaching your shadow with charm and beauty, with equanimity. So how would that experience feel? I think this is where we're suggested that we can place our attention in this work. Instead of going down and getting in there and getting like, this is hard, this is going to be rough, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to break down the walls, I'm going to, whatever. Approaching it with the romance of the Knight of Cups. And remember, Cups is also the spiritual suit, right? It's the suit of the, of the religion, but the spirituality of religion. It's the chalice of the cup. It's also the chalice of the grail. That spiritual quest, that spiritual journey, the spiritual experience of the cups. We want to integrate the spirit, our spirituality in this work of, inter, of interior, internal integration. Why? Why? Because of this, because of the star, because of hope, faith, optimism. We, ho we have hope, and it's that hope that shines and that lights our way in the path of our integration and our individuation. It's our faith that we have the potential to do this work, to accomplish this work, to become the wholeness of self to individuate on our powerful journey of intention. It's our optimism that, yes, yes, I can, I can succeed. This is possible. It's our purpose and our ability to renew and heal. Our integration, internal, interior, personal integration is a process of healing, isn't it? And this is a card of healing, spirituality, inspiration, having the vision of what an integrated self would look like, would feel like, would smell like, would taste like. Can you see who you will be, who you will become, who you are becoming? That's this card. So we approach the work as the Knight of Cups and we move in the direction that we want to go because we are and have and express and have the star as our guide and tool. 
The star is our north star. It shows us the direction. But it's also our hope, which is the tool. We can, and it's our food. If this hope feeds us on our journey. This is a beautiful, beautiful reading. That was not difficult, but took me a while. I needed to sit with it for a while to get there. Does that make sense? But I think it's beautiful. And I, this is a beautiful deck. I highly recommend it. So, okay. So, we've got the cards below. We've got the cards below at the bottom in the earth section. Let's take a look at, a look at them. These three cards are very different from most tarot cards, from most cards in other tarot decks. Yeah, these cards were painted by a, an artist which we don't know the name of um, as a tarot deck which is exploring psychology, particularly from the foundation of a Jungian model. And what cards appeared for us? From left to right, we had the man of earth. I'm sorry, the father of earth. Well, it's the man of earth who is the father, otherwise known as the king of pentacles in a Rider Waite Smith deck. Then we had the five of water, which is the five of cups. You probably get that. And then we have the seven of earth, which is the seven of pentacles. Left to right. And I think that's the direction I want to read these cards as well. Um, and we start with the man of earth, and let me show you the card up close and personal. This is the king of pentacles, the father of earth. And you notice that there is the large figure, right? With the, let's see if I can point to it, the head of the large, the large figure here with arms out, out, not outstretched, but long arms. We don't really see a body to this figure. And in front of this figure, there's a smaller figure, which is, we can see the full body up to, down to the knees. Uh, we see the head, we see the arms, the torso, and the legs, and it looks like just a little bit of genitalia. Um, and then we see this other head, is, which side is it? It's this side, over here, floating in the sky. So who are these aspects? Who are these beings? Oh, there's also, there's also wheat in the background, which is wonderful for a pentacles card, right? Wheat, the earth, the sustenance, the nourishment of the earth. We also have a, a planetary orb in the sky, which could be the sun or maybe a moon. So in this card, what I see, what the card indicates, according to the um, guidebook, are the, is the following. Will. Willpower, our will. And our pride in our accomplishments. Now, I've done a thing, as younger people say, seem to say. I've done a thing. It's our ability to lead. Now, the kings in uh, most tarot decks that I use are the leaders of their suit. They're the ones who are able to manage their element and lead in that respect. But this card is also the card of a storyteller, inspired by genius and supporting and lifting up the inner child. And that's what we get here. Now, the large figure is us, the storyteller, telling our story, lifting up perhaps our inner child, being inspired by our genius. Now, again, we're not thinking of the modern sense of genius, not uh, because we're clever or really, really smart or should go to a special school, not that kind of genius. It's our genius. It's the spirit that teaches and informs us. It's similar to a muse, but different. Now, the muses are have specific um, things that they're in charge of, like music or astronomy, and they inspire um, people who are very, very clever in those fields. Our, our personal genius is more personal and more diverse. Whatever we're interested in moving towards or doing, our genius 
can inform us if we allow it. So the genius is not spe specific to a specific to a thing like astronomy or music. It's, we don't have like, this is my music genius, this is my astronomy genius, this is my um, poetry genius. No, our genius is this eternal, wise, spiritual being that informs and teaches us if we allow, if we're open to it. So the storyteller is inspired by their genius and uh, up in their telling of the story uplifts the inner child. And is ready to take flight a little bit. Do you see that the arms of the large figure, again, we don't see the body of the large figure behind, but the arms, they look like there are feathers on them to me. A little bit. They look like there are like feathers hanging off of the arms, like they're wearing gaunt gauntlets or gloves with feathers hanging down from them. So this figure is also ready to take flight as a storyteller. But one thing, another thing that I see looking at this is I see a trinity of, and especially because of the position that the inner child in this card is in. I don't see, I see beyond the inner child, I see the child of God. And one of those expressions of child of God is Jesus. Right? Jesus who was crucified on a cross. And I see that. I see Jesus here in the crucifixion being supported by the Father, the Divine. With the Holy Spirit there, bringing that that bridge, that connection. Now, I it, if you are Christian, you probably know this part of the Bible. If you're not, you may not know, or you may know anyway I, too. Um, that on the cross, Jesus was supposed was recorded as having said. Father, Father, why have you abandoned me? Right? And have you ever felt that? Have you ever felt abandoned by the divine, neglected by the divine, neglected by your genius? And then there's that other story, a more modern story, of the person saying, Jesus, Jesus, why have you abandoned me? Why have you uh, left me? And then Jesus comes in and says, Remember when we, you were walking on the beach? Yeah, I will remember that. And I didn't see your footsteps, your footprints behind, beside me. And Jesus says, right, there was only one set of footprints. That was because it was me carrying you. You, you know that story, right? So it's that we are always being carried, but we don't recognize it. In the crucifixion, oh, sorry, in the crucifixion, that was Jesus not recognizing, not realizing that he was being carried by Spirit, by the Father, by God at that moment. And here we have the Holy Spirit bridging that, making that bridge, coming down to say, wake up. You're not alone. You have not been abandoned. That's, what, that's also what I see here. And that message is going to be important in just a little bit. But so, we have that storyteller. We are the teller of our stories. And we want to integrate with and hold up our inner child and learn from and be guided by our genius in this path of integration. That makes sense, right? Because part of our integration is telling we tell ourselves our stories in so many ways. We tell our stories our, of we tell ourselves our stories of woundedness. We tell ourselves our stories of unworthiness. We tell ourselves our stories of our brilliance and our genius and our being the eternal nature that we are inhabiting these bodies. And which stories are we going to choose? Because we are the storyteller of our lives to other people, but even more importantly to ourselves. And that's how we create our reality. 
on our paths of, in, of intention, of our, on our river of intention. So this is who we are, right? We are all the king of earth. And we want to, again, lift up this inner child, the inner aspects of self to integrate and allow ourselves to be informed and guided by and taught by our genius, which is also the eternal nature of self, which we are. But sometimes we don't, we don't really listen to ourselves, right, in that respect. We listen to the mind talking to ourselves, but we don't listen to the eternal nature that we are quite often enough. So what do we have next? We have the five of water, the five of water, the five of cups. And this in uh, Rider Waite Smith deck is the guy looking at these three knocked over cups, ignoring the two that are standing up, usually behind him, but looking at the three knocked over cups in disappointment and um, not necessarily despair, but uh, this again, maybe. Here, what do we have? We have a lot in this card and maybe it'll be difficult for you to see. We have a figure here walking on a path away from a... Oh, let's see, let me try and figure this out here so I can... So, okay, so we have a figure here walking away from a... from a structure here. And then there's another figure up here observing. So there's this figure here observing the figure here. This figure here is walking away from this structure here in the background, and there's a wall. And so <clears throat> the book tells us that this is stages of self. The home is where the child is. The figure walking away, carrying perhaps a loaf of bread or a bundle of some sort, is the young adult leaving the home. And then this figure up here is the mature adult remembering themselves walking away from their childhood selves. Does that make sense? We've got all of this in one. We've got the child in the home, protected. We have the young adult walking away, leaving home with their bundle, and then the older, the more mature self remembering and looking at this memory. So we have an older, in this card it's a man, an older person, remembering himself as a youth leaving home, carrying their nourishment, their loaf of bread, and thinking about himself as a child, which they're with, with thinking about themselves as a child, which they're now leaving behind. Have you ever, I don't, how old are you? <laughs> are you, are you old enough to do this? Um, have you ever done that, Rem thought back to when you were a younger person, an adult, but a young adult, leaving home, and, and also at the same time, the, the child who was in that home. So, you were the one leaving out on this adventure, and this adventure didn't exactly work, necessarily work out the way you thought it would. And there's that kind of, there's the nostalgia, but also a, 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 a shadowy nostalgia to that. There's, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. The home is, there's a, bird. I forgot about the bird and I can't find the bird again. Um, so there's a difficulty of emotion here. Yeah, It's that memory of leaving behind. It's the memory of, of moving forward on the path of life, which is bittersweet. The heart wanting to be mended and healed from the bitterness of that journey. Because 
this younger person is carrying the pain forward into their adult selves. And so the adult self is looking at this and remembering the bittersweet experience of having left home and not gone the way that it, they had thought they would go. Having left things behind that they, they have this nostalgic memories of. The path itself has not been smooth or easy as imagined. And there's a lot of stuff there that wants to be healed. And by recognizing that the mature self is still carrying that pain forward. So, we come from the Father of Earth, who is the terrible teller of the stories, into the story itself. And a lot of times, the story we're telling us ourselves is this one, this one of, of disappointment, of leaving things behind, of carrying our pain forward. And so, we want to do this. We want to do the Seven of Pentacles. Which, um, in this card, it's different from Hamill Coleman Smith's card, where, and I've got my, actually, my card, my, uh, my little uh, charm, my talisman charm for the day was the Seven of Pentacles, by the way. Can you see it? I'm sure you can. <laughs> if you want me to do a walkthrough of my charms, let me know in the comments below. I'll figure out a time to do that if you want. So this is the Seven of Earth. In Pamela Coleman Smith's art, we've got a farmer uh, leaning on a hoe, looking, not that kind of hoe, a, a, a farming implement hoe, and um, a tree or a bush of some kind with seven pentacles, looking and watching the pentacles grow, waiting for harvest time. And this one, what do we have? We have what looks like a figure holding a lamb, or a goat, actually, a goat. And I thought, oh, it's like the shepherd and the lamb when I first saw that. It's the shepherd comforting the lamb, holding the baby lamb and taking care of it. And then I looked at the guidebook and I was shocked and appalled. Why was I shocked and appalled? Well, because the intention for the artist for this card is a herder, a shepherd, yes, not comforting this baby lamb and nourishing the baby lamb, but it's preparing this goat for a slaughter. And we got Capricorn energy here. Remember, we had Capricorn in the Six of Swords. So Capricorn energy is here as well. It's not a sheep, it's a goat, according to the artist. Getting ready to slit the goat's neck. Not the prettiest of pictures, right? And so I thought, oh no, I don't want to read this card. <laughs> I don't want to go there. What does that have? What about all the vegetarians on, who might be watching this? What am I supposed to do? Well, of course, it's not an actual goat. This is a, a symbolic goat of self. We're talking about integration, right? So then what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to grab our animal instincts or our animalistic aspects and slaughter them, kill them? So I read further, and it's, this is hesitation or misgivings over sacrificing part of self. That makes sense. It's also the idea of scapegoating. Now, were we, what is a scapegoat? Or sacrifice, what, do you know what a scapegoat means traditionally? It doesn't mean pointing to, putting the blame on somebody else making them the scapegoat. It's where a community would place all of their sins on a goat, an animal, and then sacrifice their, that animal, and in so doing, they sacrifice their sins and uh, lift their sins up for redemption. That's the idea of a scapegoat. So, what does that mean? Well, you know what? Christ was also seen as a scapegoat. Yeah? The entire Christ in the crucifixion 
carried all of the sins of the world with Christ. I'm not going to, I don't want to say him here, with Christ. And in that sacrifice redeemed the world of those sins. Very similar to this. So what are we, am I trying to say that I think that we should all get ourselves crucified? No. That we should go out and find somebody to crucify? No. We should go out and kill a goat? No. We want to sacrifice the wounded aspects of self. What am I saying? Does that mean I'm, I'm, am I trying to say that we want to obliterate, we want to destroy those wounded aspects of ourselves? We want to kill aspects of ourselves? Yes and no. Just a moment. Just a moment. Yes and no. We're not just killing them. We're not killing them to eliminate them, to get rid of them. It's not like we're killing a body that's going to disintegrate. It's a spiritual or a psychological or a mental action of sacrificing the wounded self for that self's resurrection. Remember, in the Christ story, in the Jesus story, where are we? Where are you? <laughs> there you are. <laughs> in the Jesus Christ story, Jesus dies and resurrects, becomes the full healed nature of the Christ self. That's the whole point of the sacrifice and the story. The sacrifice heals the world and Christ is, Christ arises in the fullness of self, an integrated self of both human and divine. And so we, we can sacrifice those wounded aspects of self for their resurrection. We can lift those aspects of self onto the altar of self, perform a sacrifice for that wounded aspect's resurrection. Integrated, whole, no longer victim, but power. Does that make sense? Can you wrap your head around that? I'm, I'm still working with that. I'm still working with what does that mean? I think that I think this is very important, and I think it could be a very helpful thing for us to consider finding ways to do. I don't think the spread is telling us exactly how to do it, but a way or what to do. A way to do something or what to do. I think in our journey of trying to do the work of integration, part of that is for us to take these wounded aspects of self. Oh, I'm sorry. Here, let, let me get these cards together correctly. Take these wounded aspects of self, which we keep telling ourselves, and instead sacrifice them. Not to somebody else, not to a God, but sacrifice them for, on the altar of self, for self, for our own integration as that sacrificed element is now able to resurrect whole, new, healed. Does that make sense? So now we've got some, we've got some advice coming our way. But let's do a quick recap. What did we just see? We started off in the central cards with we want to integrate. And often we don't integrate. We get these seven of wands reversed, showing us that we're not ready to move on because we're not integrated. We don't, we're not in our power. And so we want to do the integration of the sun in reversed, become our own sun, and we have the space of the Six of Swords to do that in. Six of Swords reversed, we, we have that cove, that quiet, protected cove for us to rest in and do the work of integration. So up, where do we want to place our attention? We want to place our attention on where are we on the wheel? 
Are we on the outside going around and around and around and around, or are we able to move closer to this axle of the wheel where things don't move around so much and we can move forward more easily, more smoothly, um, and become integrated? And so how do we do that? We do that by embodying our inner knight of cups. We romance ourselves. We can uh, charm ourselves. We can use our imagination within ourselves and discover the star of hope. And so with the, in the day today, in the earthy side, we recognize that we are the storytellers of our lives to the other people, but more importantly to ourselves. And the story that we are usually telling ourselves is the story of the five of water, five of cups, of disappointments, of, of dissatisfaction, of, of uh, spilled cups. And so what we want to do is we want that self that is feeling that, we want to sacrifice that self on the altar of self for its resurrection. Does that give you an, uh, uh, an integrated storyline through this spread? So what are we going to do? We've got two cards of advice. Let's look at those. Let's look at those. My words. My word. Here we go. Those two cards are from two different oracle decks. And did you notice one of them was silence and one of them was teeth? Both of them were here, right? I mean, we don't really see the mouth so clearly in them, but things like silence can also be the um, environment as well, yes. But silence can also be here, shut your mouth, right? It can also be, also the teeth are here. So what is this saying? So let me show you the silence card. Silence. The shut your mouth card. Silence. What is this trying to tell us? Well, here we've got a woman, a veiled woman, in a beautiful hat, looking down or perhaps gazing within, perhaps within self. So this card is telling us to stop the story, I think. This card is telling us to stop the story and look within. Instead of repeating what we we always say, which keeps us on the edge of the wheel, going up and down and up and down and up and down, we want to stop, pause in our six of reversed six of swords safe space and question. What is here? Do the work, for example, one way is doing the work of Brian Katie, Byron Katie, I'm sorry, the four important questions. What is this? Well, the, those questions. Um, I'll put a link to Byron Katie in the his work below so you can get a full explanation, a better explanation from what I could do for you right now. The, those questions are, are not set in my head at this moment. I wasn't prepared to speak about her. So, quest, do the questioning. Do the introspection. Do the rumination. What is rumination? Rumination comes from ruminants. Things like cows and buffalo who don't just chew and swallow food like we do. They, they ruminate. They chew and they chew and they chew and they chew things over. So, ruminate on what experiences we've had and the thoughts we were thinking. Meditate. And invocation. Invoke our genius. Remember that genius that was on that Trinity card that we started off with, the Father of Earth, the Man of Earth? Who is the Father and the King of Pentacles? Yeah? Invoke that Holy, the Holy Spirit. Invoke... Sophia, whatever you want to name the divine element that is our bridge to the non-physical, to the eternal divine. Invoke that for, insistent, for assistance, for help, for guidance in the silence and open to that voice, open to that inspiration. As we question, what is it I, what is here? What is here? 
Who is here? Who is the one who is wounded? Who is the one who sees the one who is wounded? Now, because as, as we notice that there is a wounded aspect of ourselves, we are not that aspect of self. We are not the wounded one. We are the one observing it. And then maybe we'll recognize that, oh, I'm not the one observing the observer. I am something else. And we do that in silence. We do that in meditation. So the first thing is to look within, to question, to, to, to ruminate and meditate. To ask the questions, listen for responses, and allow quiet in consciousness to receive the spark of integration. Does that make sense? The spark of integration? And then right across from it, we have the teeth. What is the teeth? Now, can you see the teeth here? It can be a little difficult to see. Let me show it to you up close and personal. So on this side, we see in gilding. Let me move it a little bit. Do you see the gilding on this side? Those are just, those are teeth. Those are supposed to be teeth with the bright light glowing from them. And then just below and to this side, yes, we have some books. There are three books here. This is a bookshelf. So there's this big, oh, there are books up here too. But there is this big empty space on this bookshelf where the teeth are just about floating above. So what is this card telling us? This card is telling us acceptance. Accept and let go of the past. We want to let go of the past. Why? Because as we keep feeding the past, we keep our wounds alive and we diminish our potential for healing the wound itself. If we can let the past experience go and give attention to that aspect that feels wounded instead of telling instead of telling the story over and over again, if we can be quiet and give attention to that self, maybe we can begin the work of healing. Maybe we can then carry that wounded self to the altar of self for sacrifice and resurrection. So we want to let go of the past and accept the present. Because we have this, we also, do you notice this for yourself? That there are many areas in your life where we want to prevent change and we cling to the present. And we like, we bite our teeth down on what we, we have and we want. We don't want to let it go. Like a, a, like a, a is it a pit bull? that can bite things and, and hang on to them so strongly that they can lift their entire bodies up by holding on to something and they just won't let it go. Sometimes our clutching to the present is that strong. And this card is here to remind us that we want to let go of the present and allow the present to flow into the past. Now, there is only the present, but it's that clutching to what we are experiencing in the moment or what we have in the moment or the people who are around us in the moment, which cuts us off to a great extent, not entirely, to a great extent from the power of our, from our power and from the power of intention that we have available to us. Now, why do we do that? We do that because change causes anxiety, right? It, causes, it gives us insecurity. Like, does it, we experience insecurity because we're not sure what's going to happen. Where are we going? Is this person going to stay with us? Do I have to sign a contract to make that person stay with me? Or instead, can I open my hand? and allow things to change 
and have faith that the things that are mine and are beneficial for our, our united journey will stay connected with us, me, you. And those things that are not beneficial for our mutual journey will go, will flow past, fl flow into the past. Can I trust the mov movement of my current of intention? I think that's the real question. Can I trust the movement of my current of intention? And trust that the things that are beneficial for me and the things to which I am beneficial will move parallel with me with my open hands, which are now open to receive the future, what is coming, and which we often call manifestation, or the law of attraction. Now the movement is, in, is, is a mutual movement in direction. It's not something we make happen, it's something we allow to happen by opening ourselves to the power of intention and allowing that thing to move towards us as we move toward it or the person, or the situation, the, the experience, um, the creative uh, <clears throat> project, whatever it is. So the advice, again, what is it? Quiet. Be quiet. Let, oh, let the mind rest, and at the same time, be inquisitive. Look, question, what's happening? Meditate. Invoke the Holy Spirit, Sophia, whatever you want to call that genius, the anima mundi, to teach and inform us as we practice letting go of opening our hands, letting go of what is, and accepting what is. At the same time, we can accept what is and let go of it at the same time, so that we're not grasping, we're not clutching, we're not clenching our teeth but we're moving freely with the power of intention, which is the life we want to live, right? That's the life of our evolution, of our integration, of our individuation, of our development, of our living, the fullness of life that we came into these bodies to live in the first place. These, these, these cards are beautiful. Beautiful, deep, profound, lovely. Do you agree? I'd love to know if you agree. If you agree, let me know in the comments below. If you don't agree, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you think about this. Also, hit the thumbs up button if you're still here. Hit the thumbs down button if you want. YouTube, I think, if any of those things gives YouTube the signal that people are engaging in the channel and it will show the channel to more people. But hit the thumbs up button to make me happy. Um, and also to help the channel. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed and hit the alarm bell so you know when I upload videos. I'm, I have been doing three a week now. Um, I've added a new series which, in which I look at spreads, the spreads I've used and maybe spreads I'm, I'm creating or spreads that I want to investigate. I've done two videos so far. There's a playlist on my channel if you want to look at those. So there's all that stuff. And if you want a private reading from me, there, I'm always available. Shh, let me know. There's an email address below in the description box. Send me an email. We can get you a reading about anything you were interested in that is appropriate for Tarot. And we can talk about that. What's appropriate? Um, it could be a long reading. It could be a short reading. Anything you're interested in. Send me an email. Get in touch with me. We can do this thing. And friends, now, as always, I wish you love, joy, well-being, and pure awareness. Thank you.